Uh, I tweaked the title a little bit, talking about right to prepare and digital ownership. Uh, some things about me, I um, was in the Navy, submarines, went to Afghanistan. I was sent to make sure the, oh, mic is too, a little closer, is that better? Okay, we'll do one of the leaning poses. Um, okay, all right. Oh, sweet, thanks, all right. Cool, okay. Uh, yeah, sent to Afghanistan, I joke that I was sent to make sure the Taliban didn't develop a submarine force, I did my job. Um, I wrote a book called Beagle Bone for Secret Agents, did this thing, Crypto Cape with Spark Fun, I've talked at like DEF CON and, and Hope, own a security consulting company, and most recently, trying to get a EFF Alliance um, group started up for Northern Colorado by doing it with a book club. Uh, so that should be kind of fun. So why am I giving this talk? So basically I have like two conflicting ideas in my head about where I stand on this particular topic and I thought, what better way to force myself to think about it than to come up in front of a bunch of people and embarrass myself on you know, my feelings on this thing. So I thought, uh, hey, right to repair, kind of talk about, uh, you know, let's, let's talk about that. So the two conflicting ideas is I do a lot uh, with security and I help try to help companies and people secure things, right? So try to think about the threat model, how to secure a device, how to get keys on there, um, how to protect user information. These are things that I try to help, uh, specifically with embedded devices, how to help these do. But also, um, as like evidenced by I'm trying to start up this EFF Alliance group, and I feel like we want to be able to hack the things we own, and this is an open source hardware thing. I've made open source hardware. That is also a very important thing to me. And um, you know, at some point, there's this, in my head, there's like these two conflicting uh, you know, tensions, and is, you know, is that a problem? You know, can I explore this a little bit? And then also kind of combined to that, when I started looking into this, you know, we have laws saying we can't fix our own things, so basically what's up with that? Um, so there's two examples I want to um, show that kind of explore a little bit how I'm framing this. One is a 1920s typewriter, the other is uh, a hypothetical open source hardware webcam. Let's consider the lonely typewriter. Okay, so this typewriter in 1920, it does one thing. It's like the perfect embedded device, right? It's a very responsive user experience. You type and it's, words show up on the paper. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, you don't have to use anyone else's paper. You could buy the vendor's paper or you could go buy other paper. You could use your own paper. Um, it's very easy to modify. Uh, the user is arguably in complete control of this typewriter. You know, you can, be re you can repair it, like everything's there. But, and this is the kind of twist that has me you know, thinking, is that a typewriter is not going to break the inter internet. Uh, it may start a revolution. Uh, in fact, there's a book called The Typewriter Revolution. But uh, you know, a malicious typewriter is not going to break the internet. Let's consider open source hardware webcam. Um, so this, uh, in this webcam, right, everything's open source hardware, schematics, bomb, even the firmware. It's got nice debug headers. You can put any adapter on there. There's no like epoxy or anything. Uh, open source drivers for everything, but webcams can break the internet. Um, so this is like the Mirai botnet, um, literally, you know, took down parts of the internet because there was it, not because of any open source thing, but because basically it was an insecure device. So um, yeah, if you make an an open source hardware thing and you're trying to like, connect it, so in the in the example to the webcam was like, hey, I, it'd be cool if I could. It's great that it's open source. I would be cool if I could check, you know, to see if my kids, you know, what they're doing. Maybe that involves a cloud service, and that cloud service can be completely open source, but you still don't want like other people to look at your kids, right? So there's some, you know, you, and they're not mutually exclusive either, but these are problems that you have to solve if you make something like that. How do you provide firmware updates to your device? How do you authenticate that device back to your service? You know, how do you prevent like trivial tampering so that it like undermines the security of your user's data? And then how do you prove that you own this thing? and uh, so that you could use the service and not use someone else's service. So it turns out basically we don't really own our things anymore. Um, so there's a, a lot of my uh, like research on this is kind of influenced by these three books, well, two books and one article um, that highly recommended the books um, and they kind of go a lot more detail than what I'm gonna be able to go to today. But some examples, you know, books versus eBooks. Uh, you don't, despite you clicking buy now on Amazon, you don't actually own that ebook, right? You have a license to use that ebook. If you try to share that ebook with a friend, you might have realized that there are some you can't share. Even with DRM free ebooks, you actually can't resell them, right? Like you have the license to use them on every device, and that's cool, but there you, you can't, like, with a regular book, you can sell it, you can resell it, um, but you have a lot more pa power over the ownership of that book. John Deere tra Tractors is another one that comes up. Um, they are not so willing to let you like repair the tractor that you bought. 
uh, Apple phones. So Apple had a lobbyist sent to Nebraska and said basically that a bunch of, if uh, Nebraska passes a right to repair law in Nebraska, it'd be a mecca for hackers. I, for one, would welcome a bunch of computer security experts in Colorado rather than another Apple store. So, uh, you know, could have a benefit there. If you buy a Tesla, you can't use it for Uber because Tesla has, is trying to make an autonomous car service, right? So you bought this car, but there's these restrictions on how you can use them. So in the future with our smartwatch, smart thing, the red thing, the blue thing, like this is really only gonna get worse about what we can and can't do with these devices. Like, well, why can't we do it? Why, like, what's the deal? So um, you buy the hardware, right? But the hardware is kind of becoming the commodity, right? So the thing is like the software. So you can get the software as a service and all these things that people want and all the convenience. But there was this law, the DMCA, um, that was passed in 1998 that kind of gave a lot more enforcement to some of this stuff. And it has this kind of catch-22 where you have to agree to the terms of service to use the software and use the license. But if you don't click agree, but you bypass it anyway, you're violating the DMCA. Um, so you're kind of always in this kind of screwed. Um, so, but, I mean, there is like a problem here, and the problem is that we, we you know, companies, whether it's open source or, or a proprietary company, they want to make connected devices, they want to try to make them secure, uh, and non, you know, let's assume a non-cynical example where they're not just trying to do vendor lock-in and all that stuff. Um, but like a lot of times they're, they're resorting to this like security by law, which is completely ineffective, insofar as the technology, but it can be effective in a, um, a silencing uh, approach. So, like, how would you do this? How do you, would you make a secure, repairable, resilient device that is open source and works not just in the consumer model, but like in a scale in industrial IoT? And what I mean by that generally is that in industrial IoT, the number of devices exponentially go up compared to literally the amount of people, whereas a consumer device, you know, may have, uh, you know, managed devices that you can manage. In large-scale IoT deployments, not, you know, you're going to have to have some sort of management of these devices. And so, you know, these books that I mentioned before, but they kind of talk about one of the, they kind of suggest one idea of like how this would work in an analog way. Well, it's like, how do you know you own your house? So obviously I'm here. If someone breaks into my house, you know, how do they, how do you know that person isn't the owner of my house? Well, it turns out like um, you have to consult some information. So in this case, there's like a database of, uh, in the city council where we would say, actually, you know, Josh bought that house. Um, and, but you know, that's just information about the house. There's nothing when I go to my car and open up that is immediately obvious that I own my car, except you'd have to look at the title. Um, so this is information that is about that thing that is going with it to say whether or not I own it. And lastly, you know, this idea of like, well, I could sell you my car, then I could sell it to somebody else, and then, you know, what's the deal? I just made twice. Well, this, you know, the idea of transferring the title kind of prevents this. And so before we start the eye rolling, um, you know, and despite my hipster uh, look right now, I'm not going to do the typical Silicon Valley TEDx thing and just say blockchain solves everything. Um, you know, I'm not that naive, but I, those books do talk about, yeah, in that this is more than a technical problem, this is definitely a social problem. But in those books, and I do some things uh, with like cryptocurrency. So I just want to explore, if you'll let me, uh, what that would look like for some blockchain uh, enabled devices and how it may affect this digital ownership and how it could start to maybe change the, the tide. Caveat on four. You know. Okay, so with digital, with something like a blockchain, and there's this great paper basically saying you don't need a blockchain, and there's like, you know, very, there's very Naviat thing. So we'll just roll with this for now. But basically, if you have this idea, you have a smart shoe and it, you bought this super cool upgrade to like get the LEDs to do something, or maybe you, you hacked it or something, but somehow you've changed that device. But then you also want to sell that device, which is kind of, um, you know, so now the way that work, you'd sell that device and then that other person would have to buy that upgrade, right? Because that's how companies, they don't really like the secondary market. Um, but you, if you have this something, you know, that could track that property, if you make that modification to the property and that goes with the device, you know, that would be like showing that you own the device. Just like if you change your house, you know, you don't have to make the next person buy the new water heater that is coming with it. Um, if you have a bunch of, you have your automobile and you like hack it so that you can do off-roading or whatever you, you know, want to do and you modify that ECU, that which is the uh, engineering control unit, um, you know, that's cool, but like the next person you sell it to may or may not be okay with that. They may want to run stock. So if that device was basically like, uh, hey, I've been modified, uh, and that could go with that device, that would be, that would be kind of cool. Also, like, if you bought this really expensive tractor, maybe you want to, maybe the OEM is trying to restrict who gets the repair model for something, but you would need a way to prove, like, oh, actually, I do have this tractor, it's right here. Um, 
And so to get down a little more detail, uh, happy to talk about this after, um, you know, for anyone who's interested, but like, I uh, just want to explore like, what would it look like to make a blockchain enabled device? Um, so there's really like two components to any like this blockchain magic. It's just a public private key pair. There's an asymmetric part and a private part. And there's a couple ways you can do it, but for the public part, you could just, you just have to get some identifier on a device. This is not unlike a QR code or some other serial number you would typically have. It's just in this special format and has special meaning. So RFID, NFC, um, EEPROM, something like this. And there's this super cool like NXP chip that's like an NFC device that's energy harvested. And uh, I love to geek out about it anyway, but you can do some cool stuff. Um, you could also put the private key on the device. So you, this would uh, arm, you basically need something that does the crypto to sign a transaction. That's like an ARM MCU can be done. There's a device called the Trezor, which is the Bitcoin hardware wallet. Um, and you could have something like that on there and it'd be cool if it was under this interface. But you can, you know, you can kind of get these. Um, you know, it's not as hard as you think, I think on the hardware level. It's just a software problem. So the irony here is that the cloning of hardware has actually become kind of easy, mainly because of the results of people in this room, right? We making it easy to clone hardware um, because we're giving away basically how, how to do that. The flip side is it's kind of been harder to clone digital assets, right? Which is the, the, one of the problems that the blockchain does solve, right? Because cloning is super easy with software, but by having a track and the kind of the way the blockchain works, that's actually a very hard thing to do. Um, you know, so how does this work out for like open source hardware? Well, if you wanted to, have, if you made a product and you wanted to have it to be connected to some, some, some service and not, and this whole thing could be open source, even the server side, right? But you could have these tokens to verify, hey, this guy actually bought it versus, you know, this clone. And maybe you want to differentiate on that. Um, also, instead of like a Kickstarter kind of thing, there's these things called initial coin offerings, which are most of the time scams, but um, they have some interesting ideas of like, where you could be able to buy this digital token and that would be, you would trade in the token for the hardware and that would be the way to like enable services or something. Uh, and again, there's nothing, you know, all this could be open source. So um, wrapping up, basically, I think that this right to repair, um, I think there's, and you can go to repair.org for more information, but. What I saw in looking into this, that right to repair is really this pushback of the abuse of copyright law to kind of enforce this ownership. Um, and as a result uh, of digital things, especially, we're not actually owners of these things, we're licensees. And because we're licensees, we don't have all the ownership rights that you would typically as associate when you actually, you know, click buy now and bought something. And insofar as the blockchain, I mean, I think it has some potential. Um, I mean, there's some like interesting ideas there to the extent that it's practical and the extent that it's really gonna change this. I mean, I think the laws obviously have to change and there's a bigger society change. Um, so, I mean, it's not gonna be the answer, but I do think by having some of those ideas of establishing ownership of the device that can be not so you have to keep buying licensing or make someone else buying it. If there's a way to track the device like you do have in your house or your car, that has the potential to give ownership back to consumers, to back to people who, so they can repair things, so they can modify things, um, and that you know may help in this area. So that's it.